Good morning. We come in our daily Bible reading to James chapter 3. And what we find in this chapter are some scary and unfortunately relatable truths about how terrible the tongue can be and how difficult it is to tame. Now, as we look at James chapter 3, we're going to notice three distinct warnings, one for teachers, one for the tongue that is related, of course, to the idea of teaching, but even for all of us as well. And then thirdly, the idea of peace, division, or worldly wisdom, or heavenly wisdom. So as we break down James chapter 3, let's make sure that we fall on the side of God in each and every one of these avenues. Begin the reading with me in verse 1 of James chapter 3. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also, though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a force is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. Now, this is not the New Testament's most uplifting section, but it's a challenge for us that if we acknowledge is true, and certainly it is being the Word of God, we realize how relatable and how big of a struggle this is. But let's key in on the context. In verse 1 in particular, who is in mind? Well, teachers. In fact, there's a strange warning from Scripture. We often think of evangelism as a good thing. We think of evangelism as the preacher or an elder or someone who's been a Christian for a long time or someone who's skilled at speaking. They go out and they do all the teaching. And, and while everyone who we just named could and should be involved in teaching, evangelism is more than just someone public speaking in an effective way. Verse 1, though, talks about being careful about those who are teachers, which is a little bit surprising to us. We would think the New Testament, we would think God wants everyone to be teachers. And what we see in verse 1 is really that there's a calculation that needs to be had. But before we look at that in a negative light, remember that in Luke chapter 14, Jesus makes it clear that we're to count the cost of following him. And God certainly wants everyone to be Christians, to be children of his, to submit to his will. And so this is not saying don't be a teacher, but it's saying consider the cost of teaching. Well, what is the cost? Well, you know, verse 1, that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. Now, how could this be and why would this be? Well, number one, someone who is teaching has to first, theoretically at least, have a mastery or at least some knowledge of what they're teaching. We would like to think that we want to learn from somebody who knows how. I have no idea how to pilot a plane, and I wouldn't go and find someone else who's never been on a plane to teach me. I'd want to learn from a pilot. In fact, in particular, I'd want to learn from an experienced pilot, maybe someone who's been flying for 20 years, maybe someone who served in the military and then on a commercial airline who has experience in all different kinds of aircraft. That's a good teacher. But also the second part comes out in the context of the tongue because there's this shift in James 3 to a very applicable section on how dangerous the tongue can be. And what does a teacher do? Well, primarily they're involved in teaching with the spoken word and with their words. And so whether that's in pen, on paper, or with our, with our words from our mouths, we realize that teachers say a lot of things. And we not only have to make sure that we know the subject matter, but we have an influence on those who are listening. Teachers need to have someone to teach. And so if I'm being careful to be a teacher, that means I'm also being careful in that I am authentic to God's word. As Christians, whatever level we teach in, whether it's our kids or in a Bible class or in an auditorium or at a dinner table with a close friend, however we teach, we need to make sure that it's not me at all, that it's God's word. That it's not about my effectiveness, it's not about my skill, it's about God being glorified. And when we do that, we have less to worry about when it comes to judgment as a teacher. But yes, we need to make sure we're not hypocritical in our lifestyle. We need to make sure that we're accurate to the word of life. And then for all of us, let's look at verse 2 through 6 again. And we see that there's three different examples of how powerful the tongue is. Verse 3 is the first one. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so they obey us, we guide their whole bodies. So you can guide a horse, right? Verse 4, look at the ships also. They are so large and driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. Now we think of this big ship. And then, of course, yes, in verse 5, how great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. Now this is interesting to see that in verse 2, we stumble in many ways. And if we don't stumble in what we say, we're perfect, meaning everybody stumbles in what they say. We struggle maybe with self-control of our speech or the words we choose or lashing out in anger or in bitterness or in slandering. Or maybe we sow doubts of worry and fear in others. 
We're not positive examples. We're not speaking true things. Maybe we have a problem with lying about others, and that could fit into slander and bitterness also. Whatever our specific temptation is, we need to make sure, again, number one, that we are authentic to the Word of God. Particularly as a teacher, there's no room for error. Does that mean that we can't make a mistake and we can't be forgiven? No, God is forgiving. We need to make sure that we let God do the talking. But even on a day-to-day -day conversation that doesn't have to do with the New Testament or the Old Testament or the things about God at all, what kind of person am I in my speech? Am I constructive? Am I building up? Or am I destructive and tearing down? It's pretty easy to decide when you meet somebody if they're an uplifting person, a glass half full, or maybe a glass half empty. And not surprisingly, who do you generally like to be around? Well, you generally like to be those who are uplifting, those who are constructive. And so, yes, while we all struggle, we need to, the most of the time, in the higher percentage of the day, be positive people. That doesn't mean just saying positive things, but it means being authentic, true, and uplifting. We need to be encouragers rather than discouragers. And really, that's what the text continues on into verse 6. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. And before we end up by looking at those last few verses with the rhetorical answers in which the answer is no, you cannot do two things at once like that, let's go back to what it says in verse 6. The tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness also, set on fire by hell. It is a restless evil, verse 8, full of deadly poison. This is serious. <laughs> you know the scariest part about James chapter 3 is we all have a tongue, and as verse 2 mentions, we all struggle with it. And this is something that is dangerous. But then I want to go back to verse 5 for a moment, the second phrase. How great a force is set ablaze by such a small fire. And really there's a negative impact uh, drawn by James chapter 3 in the connotation here. That a fire can start with just one little match. An entire force, an entire state seemingly can be on fire from just that one small bad decision. And that's the same way with the tongue. We say one thing and we can ask for forgiveness. We can be forgiven. But the physical consequences of the scars that we make with our tongue are left. And we realize that others can leave those scars on us too. And so how do we avoid that? Well, it says no one can tame the tongue. I don't think this means we'll give up and just be mean, lash out to people, say whatever comes to mind. But count the cost. Consider how serious what we say is. Don't just speak without thinking. In fact, going back to James chapter 1, even though the context is a little bit different, there's a lot of good advice in verse 19 of James chapter 1. Be quick to hear, slow to speak, Slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. We need to make sure that we are self-controlled, and that will be displayed by our speech. How much thought do I give to that? And then on the other hand, we need to make sure as we look at these rhetorical questions at the end, verse 9, with it we bless our Lord and Father, with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. Obviously, cursing others is wrong. We need to view others as made in the image of God, and so they are special. But verse 10 and 11 and 12, we can't be two things at once. And so, yes, we need to make sure that we don't give in to a lack of self-control. We don't give in to anger. We don't burn down the forest. However, if the tongue is that powerful, let's think about the positives for a moment here. What can we do with just a word? We can encourage someone having a terrible day. With just a phone call, with just an email, with just a text message, we can lift someone's spirits who feels like the world's out to get them and they're all alone. With just a word, we can teach about the good news of Jesus Christ, that Jesus died for the sins of the world. And so when I make a mess of my life, someone can bring to me the good news that salvation is possible, or as a Christian even, forgiveness is possible if I'm willing to turn my life over to God. The tongue is a frightening proposition to control, but it also can do great good. And again, I'm left with this question. Am I constructive or destructive in my speech? One final section here today in verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, 
full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. I do think that last verse is one of those highlight ones. James chapter 3 and verse 18, a harvest of righteousness is sown how? In peace by those who make peace. So whether it's with our word or our action, what kind of people are we? Are we people who sow peace and can have this harvest of righteousness? Or are we those characterized by verse 14 and 16, jealousy and selfish ambition? Or in verse 14, even bitter jealousy and selfish ambition. What do I live for? Do I live to make myself look good, to put, prop myself up at the cost of others, put them down to make myself look or feel better? Or do I live to sacrifice and serve? Yes, it's mentioned in verse 9, with it we bless our Lord the tongue and Father, and we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. And obviously we should not curse people, but notice that last phrase, who are made in the likeness of God. We should exalt them, lift them up, not just with our tongue, but in our minds. We should be sacrificial for others, realizing they are special. We should love our neighbor as ourself, the biblical wisdom goes. And so in verse 16, where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. So what is the opposite of a life focused on jealousy and selfish ambition? Well, the opposite is verse 17. Wisdom from above is first pure, peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. Can we highlight and underline verse 17 for a moment and just think about our politics? It might very well be that the presidential election has been decided. And I know there's a lot of courts and legal battles and things going on and a lot of things that are up in the air, potentially. Either way, regardless of who wins or how long it takes to decide, can we look at verse 17 and see as a Christian, what kind of person we should be, not only with the word of God, but in general. We should be gentle, peaceable, and here's that phrase, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. Am I closed-minded or open-minded? Is my speech constructive or destructive? James chapter 3 is more of that practical wisdom from above. What does a Christian's life look like? And how can we get there? Let's start by working on self-control, controlling our tongue, and lifting others up, who, after all, are made in the likeness of God. Praise be to God that he's merciful and gracious to us. Praise him and thank him for the day and also for his forgiveness and sending Jesus to die on the cross for our sins today. I hope you join us on Monday as we study James chapter 4 and continue learning from the wisdom of God.